So she is going to share her knowledge of geology. So, Haley. Okay. Before I get started, I will say my name is Haley, and if you see it spelled, you might call me Hallie or something else, but that's okay. I'll always answer whatever you <laughs> call so, Don't feel bad if you ever say my name. She's very tall. I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that it's spelled differently. Um, also, if you drink coffee, during any of these events. I'm the coffee maker, but I don't drink coffee, so please tell me if it's terrible, um, because I really wouldn't know otherwise. So just as a note, sorry, the coffee's terrible. Let me know, I'll work on it, so. All right. Is it? Good. Is it good? Good. 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 It's okay, if you're honest, I would not have hurt feelings at all. Okay. That's good. Okay. Do you mind? Right. That way I can find out. Well, all right. So we will start. Um, today we're going to talk about geology or the rocks here on Ponte Prairie. And um, this story that they tell about um, our past environment and why we should like them so much. Um, I'm going to pass around one rock um, and we're going to be working. It's kind of dark, you know, but. You can kind of get a little glance at it. We're going to be working first to identify what type of rock it is. <laughs> we'll see here. I'll work with your low set. There we go. Oh, now I went way too far. Okay. So here's the rock cycle. Um, this is just um, the cycle that rocks go through. Um, we're going to be working to find out um, whether the rock that we're passing around is either igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary. So, um, yes, not all rocks are the same. We have three different types, and the differences between the types of rocks um, makes, mostly has to do with how they're formed. So we're going to look more specifically at um, which type of rock it is. I have a cartoon over here on this side says the three types of rock are classic punk and hard rock. But. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so our igneous rocks are formed when magma cools and hardens. Um, some of the characteristics that could help you identify an igneous rock would be whether it has a glassy surface or some others might have gas bubbles inside of them. Some common examples of igneous rocks would be basalt, which is our top picture here is a basalt. So you can see these gassy bubbles that are inside of them. Um, or obsidian which has that glassy texture, it's kind of hard to see maybe on this slide, but it looks like a piece of glass. Um, so these are igneous rocks, so as you look at um, the rock that we're passing around, you might be thinking, does it look like either of those? Um, there's also metamorphic rocks, which are formed by intense heat and pressure. Um, so they form underground. There are characteristics that could help you identify them, or they might have crystals showing, or they might have ribbon-like layers. So I have two examples here. Um, the top example is marble, um, and it's actually limestone under intense heat and pressure forms marble. So um, that's our top picture. And if you get really closer, if you saw it on a different screen, you might see that there's some crystals in there. Um, also, this bottom rock spelled differently, but it's called nice, and it's got those ribbon-like layers in it. Let me know if you want me to zoom in on any of these. Okay, thank you. And then um, the third type of rock is sedimentary rock. Um, these are formed from sediment. And sediment would be any particle of sand, shell, pebble, or other <coughs> fragment of material that accumulates in layers over long periods of time into rock. So some of the characteristics that could help you identify a sedimentary rock would be that you might see that there is sand or pebbles in it. Um, and also sedimentary rocks are the only of the three types of rock that um, regularly contain fossils. So examples of sedimentary rocks would be conglomerate, and a conglomerate is like a big... Is there a word? A big blob. It's a big conglomerate is what I'm going to say, you know. Um, so you can see here that there's like all kinds of like, it's just kind of like a bunch of stuff like conglomerated together. And then as well as limestone is a sedimentary rock. So, um, of the three types of rocks, which do you think that the rock that we passed around is? The sedimentary, right on. Very good. It's actually a piece of limestone. So, sedimentary rocks are actually really important, and it's really great that we have them because they can tell a lot about the history um, of the past environment. So, just like um, scientists might look at the rings on a tree to find out more about its past environment, 
They can also look at layers of rock to find out more about the past environment of that location. If I'm going really fast or really slow, tell me. This being the Flint Hills, mm -hmm. what category does Flint fall in? Very good. We'll get there in just a few minutes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. You're all into it. Okay, so by studying all of um, our rocks, um, scientists have formed the geologic time scale, and it's a record of life forms and geological events in Earth's history, and they developed it by studying rock layers and fossils. Of course, those fossils found in sedimentary rocks um, as well, so they formed the geologic time scale. And the geologic time scale is the same, but it can be presented in a lot of different ways. So this is just one example um, that's kind of colorful and cute, so I liked it, so I chose it for this slide. But um, you also have a copy of the geologic time scale in your docent handbook, and it looks a little bit different, but it's always the same in that um, it's, it shows the time periods of Earth's history from the beginning, and, and it will usually show the oldest rocks at the bottom and the youngest at the top, that's called the law of superposition. So that's a fancy way to say old stuff on the bottom, new stuff on the top. So like if you imagine you have your desk full of stuff and you keep laying papers there over time, the paper that you laid there the longest to go is on the bottom. So rocks the same way with sedimentary rock layers. It's always the oldest on the bottom, um, with the exception of like falls and um, erosion. We'll talk more about that. Um, but so it's made up of all of these eras. These are called eras. Um, so the Archean, the Proterozoic, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Those just denote specific time periods. And they're not based on a certain number of years. It's not like every era is a certain like 1.5 billion years or something like that. They're just broken by differences in the rocks that they see. Like so if there's a major change in flora or fauna, during that time, then they would split it. So, so these aren't equivalent amounts of time per era. And then we also can break each of these eras into different periods by smaller changes that are happening in the flora and fauna that they've studied. So for example, the Paleozoic era is split into all of these periods that are also here in blue. So the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian are all part of the Paleozoic era. And we've got um, the numbers of millions of years ago that these would have formed. And actually, through studying the rocks, um, we find that the rocks here at Kanza are formed during the Paleozoic era, and most specifically during the Pennsylvanian and Permian periods. Before you leave that, uh -huh. point out with the um the fauna with the animals? Yes. What animals are associated with the, the Pennsylvanian and the Permian? I mean, if you just look over on the Very left. Good. So you can see um, over here um, some of the types of um, animals that might have been around or um, organisms that might have been around at that time. Um, we can see some coral here, um, <coughs> some brachiopods, which are shells. We're going to talk about all of these fossils later. And we'll also um, point out that we won't because of where our rocks come from during this time period, um, we aren't going to have dinosaurs because the dinosaurs were around in the Mesozoic. So we're not going to have any dinosaur fossils to look at because our rocks were formed before dinosaurs. So. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what book I was reading, but they said that when our limestone, when our oceans were here, that this was Pangaea that it had, the continents hadn't separated, and that actually our area was down at the equator. It, Is that right? It's true, and we'll, okay. I have a couple of slides that show over time you might have heard of Pangaea. That's when all of the continents were um, <laughs> gathered together, and they've moved um, through plate tectonics through their positions that they're at today. Um, but those processes that move the continents are um, things that cause things like earthquakes, um, rifting and stuff like that. So we're going to get there and I'll show pictures of where we were at when our rocks formed, like where on the earth we were at. Does that help? It helps because those were equatorial seas so that you see this was an equator type uh, environment. environment. Yeah. Hot. Yeah. yeah. It was also very shallow, is that not correct? I mean, it would dry and <coughs> build. 
multiple times during that. True. Sure. You guys are on it. You know exactly <laughs> where I'm headed. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. Um, you're not going to be able to read the specifics here, but um, you do have a copy of this as well. This um, picture right here in your docent handbook. Um, it shows the um, the layer cake um, of the sediments that are here at Ponza Prairie. Um, and highlights are the ones that we see most often. Um, and so the oldest rock layer is here or here? Bottom or top? Bottom. Bottom, right. So typically the oldest limestone layer you're going to see is the Neva limestone. So these are all um, named um, just to help you know identify which ones they are. Um, and then it's um, an alternating pattern that you're going to see of limestones and shales. Then the limestone, then shale, limestone, shale, limestone, shale, limestone, shale, limestone, shale, limestone. So, so they're broken into these groups, like with big names, and then subdivided from there to names like the Neva or the Neva limestone. I'm not exactly sure how most pronounce that. Yes. I can't read, but is the how limestone on that chart? H O W E. No, it's not. Is there a, an outcrop of that that you've seen? Oh, it's down below. It's down below. Very good. And actually, um, there are. It, we go as low as the Long Creek. Um, in some of the um, creek beds, I think it's Shane Creek. Am I? The, the how is visible at one good spot in Kings Creek. I, okay. So I was right, just so curious. Very good. So we actually, our rocks go as low as this Long Creek limestone that's clear down here. Um, but for most typical hills, um, these are the, this is the section that we're going to see. But you're right, we go all the way down to the Long Creek and, and um, even like four beds above that is that Howe limestone. So there's one spot you can see the Long Creek limestone um, that I'm aware of and then past that there will be other places you could see these limestones and shales, but most commonly you're going to see these that are highlighted. Thank you for pointing that out. The lowest spot on Kanza is out here where we first come in. Should you find the uh, low, the oldest limestone at the lowest spot? The oldest exposed, I think, is in the creek bed based on what I've read, but but I haven't been out there and I haven't done the research myself. So, I and, think that and I might have mistaken that. that. The bed of Kings Creek at the lowest elevation mm -hmm. in Kanza would be the lowest yeah. layer. Not if the layers are tilted. <coughs> Not if the layers are tilted. That's not well, I know the layers right. can be tilted. Right. Not very really much. No, not it's, a whole lot. It's fairly I mean, horizontal. I'll look into that and I'll let you know tilt. next week. I'll do more research into that. But um, primarily, we'll be focusing on these highlighted layers. Um, but you're right, we, I need to do more research about the lower layers, and I'll get back to you on that next week. Um, but as this forms, you'll notice that it's a limestone and a shale, and a limestone and a shale. And that's called a cyclothem, which is a cyclic pattern um, of rock types that we see here. And that's actually really helpful to help us understand more about our past um, environment here. And I should probably zoom back out a little bit. <coughs> okay, so here is a cross section of a typical here on hill here on Kanza. So, um, so there are these older layers, um, but usually the um, exposed areas um, you'll see from the needle limestone. Um, all of the limestones are in black, and then all of the shales or mudstones are in white. So you can see this cyclical pattern that switched from um, limestone to shale. So which ones are harder? Which ones are denser? The limestone is a lot harder and so they form benches and then these um, shales are, we're going to talk more specifically about them, they form just like the slopes in between. So let's look specifically at limestone. Most limestone are marine deposits which would be really interesting especially to students that come out because they look around and we're in the middle of Kansas and they're like, we have marine deposits here. That's kind of interesting. Um, so limestone, excuse me, limestone forms um, when the shells of marine animals that consist of calcium carbonate 
um, die and their shells are left on the ocean floor or a lake bottom or riverbed. Um, but they may accumulate into thick deposits and over time that forms the limestone. Um, as a fun fact, calcium carbonate fizzes with hydrochloric acid. So if you have any hydrochloric acid lying around and you want to tap it, it's pretty fun. Do you use vinegar too? Right? Yeah, and we, we have we have a lot of hydrochloric acid, and we have I don't tell anyone, but we have we have little dropper bottles. So docents can have a little dropper bottle of, and, and Nancy Golden does this all the time of hydrochloric acid, and that's it's just a fun thing to do. Yeah, they like it, don't they, Nancy? Yes, I would highly recommend it. And uh, you need to go up to a place where you have not only the limestone, but also the flanter of the church. And to compare. And yeah. show the difference between the two. Yeah. So we'll do that, and we'll all, we'll all get, you all get a little bottle of hydrochloric acid, Charlie, while we <laughs> get those put together. And, yeah. Go ahead. I think this is changing the subject a minute, but when we have visitors day in September, that would be a really nice thing to have <coughs> with the kids to do the yeah. kids. Yeah. Okay. They don't get the bottles of hydrochloric acid. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm kidding. It, it doesn't have to be hydrochloric acid either. Right. Uh, right. It supposedly could be vinegar things. would work, but yeah. vinegar works pretty slow. Yeah. We're all about action. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wish I just remember doing that in elementary school. Run, 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 run. Until yeah, that would be interesting. Diane? Um, so it says most limestones are marine deposits. How would other limestone form? Freshwater. See, they're troll makers. They are. I know. <laughs> Gosh. No, it's just that we've gotten so <laughs> far into it. No, it's, yeah, no, it's <laughs> great. I'm glad that you're asking questions. But um, I want to make sure I double check on all my facts. I'm always worried I'm going to give wrong information. So can I tell you more about it? Can sure. I, later. Okay. Yeah. Great. I will get back to you on that. I'm always worried I'm going to give misinformation, and then I think that's so hard to rewind and get out of your head. Yeah. Well, I think it's like uh, someone else saying that it can come from freshwater right. systems, like it says there, the lake bottoms or the river bottoms, because you get diatoms and stuff in freshwater systems too, which have calcium carbonate shells, and they will fall yeah. to the bottom. She's an aquatic girl. Yeah. <laughs> and for that, I thank you. Good job. <laughs> but, but I have a question. I thought most diatoms were silica rather than calcium carbonate. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, we're going to get pictures. <laughs> but there are still mussels and stuff. Is that diatoms? Yeah, yeah, that are freshwater. Yeah. And there's the radiolarians in the freshwater. Oh, we have another aquatic guy. <laughs> or are, are you? What's your background, Mike? Journalism. Anything goes here. That's true. Feel free to jump in. So those are our limestones, and then actually within our limestone, we've talked about um, there's chert, which is a hard rock um, that's dark, opaque, and composed of silica. Um, it forms through a chemical process um, where the silica is leaked in, then takes over. Um, hard to explain. I don't know if there's a perfect explanation. I wish I could explain it better to you, but um, so it occurs in nodules of land. And I know Joe has, when I'm done, Joe's going to bring it home with the most amazing collection of fossils and rocks that you've ever seen. So, um, so you get a chance to look at that. Um, but um, chert or flint is bad on tires because it's like glass. Um, so frown face for Jill's tires. I think she's gone through a lot of tires. Um, and then, but it's really good uh, for other purposes like early tools. Um, they were used for knife blades, spear points, arrowheads, all really good stuff for um, early settlers. And so we've got that within our limestone layers. And if you're curious where you can find the most flint, what, through what I've read, I found that our top layer here, the Florence limestone, um, is one of the, on here on Ponza, is one of the best places to find the flint. It's the most flint rich, but it's also available in the other limestone layers as well. It's also so let's stop here for a second, because Florence is kind of hard to find on Conza. There's like, what, one spot on Conza where you can find Florence? Yeah, on the top of Bison Loop. Yeah, because it's not at the top of Butterfly Hill. Um, <coughs> There's a good yeah, that one place at the top of the Bison Loop. Three Mile has some good ones. 
Say what? I believe it's the three mile has some good news. Yeah. So that's right here. Yes, yeah. three, yeah. Miles three, three miles, Royer. Three miles, very good. It's, it's uh, some nice thick layers up several inches in places. Yeah, Florence, Florence is kind of hard to find. Okay. Where you really find the Florence is in southern Kansas and northern Oklahoma. <coughs> but if we're if we're taking a docent route, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it, it, it's really exposed more down there. Yeah. 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 So we're we're going to see mostly three okay. mile around. So it's really good. Alrighty. I have a, a different oh, question. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Back to that yes. slide. Would you like? Uh, okay. Flint and Church. At the Discovery Center, everything is labeled church. Okay. Out here, we always use the term flannel. What should we use out here? I will defer that question to possibly Jill or um, I think this is a, a debate between scientists even. Which I, think, they, I think you should you should explain that they mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. That flint is the same thing flint as is church. Considered to be a higher quality. I, I, but but it's not. <coughs> the, the geologists are saying they're interchangeable. So, so they're interchangeable in that they form from the same thing. And they're so silicon chemical. dioxide. Right. But you know, for our audience, for our audience, keep it simple right. and say yeah, they're, they're the same yeah. thing. And so you're going to see it at the museum as church, and out here you're going to see it as blend. This is you know, look down, pick up a piece. This is what it looks like. I agree. Interchangeable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why, why they use church at the museum. I think that complicates matters. Mm -hmm. I do think that's a pretty debated along with scientists whether which they should refer to it as. We, um, the we have groups of lumpers and splitters. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. the, the church and the and it's all really the, essentially the same thing. That's all I'm going to say about it. I volunteer to research this because I think it's a language thing. You know, our, our language is a compilation of other languages. And one of the things that drives people crazy when they're trying to learn English is that we have lots of terms for the same thing. You can call it a bag, a sack, a handbag. You can call it flint or chert. So I'll go to the OED and look both of them up, the Oxford English Dictionary, and see if there really is any distinction I, I between the two. I'm going to find it in the Oxford English Well, and then I'll ask somebody. You're going to find it in you know, the geology text, and it's going to be obscure and specific. And well, it's let's do both. Beyond. Really? OK. All right. It's, it's going to be beyond what, what we need to do here for our jobs. If we were, if we were geologists specializing in flint <laughs> slash church, then, then it might be pertinent. But here, well, who's the man who gave the last geology lecture? Because he said Keith. they mean the same thing. Keith, Keith. Miller said they mean same the thing. same thing. And Paige Twist said that, that there's, there's minor differences, but it's minor. OK. So like it, the it, Wikipedia it's thing, right? <coughs> it says it's the same thing except flint is considered to be slightly higher quality stuff. Yeah, my to my point is be laboring something yeah. that doesn't need to be labored. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike has a question or comment. I think an easy way to short circuit is if they want the scientific, it's chalcedony is the mineral, and another reason way to refer to it is microcrystalline quartz. What kind of journalist are you? <laughs> 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 are you a scientific journalist? Um, I used to have a website for TwinCities.com, and yeah, Natural History was one of my views. Oh, okay, okay. We're going to pull it out of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back. Okay, so we have um, the alternating layers of limestone, which also... That is not my tire, by the way. <laughs> it, <is laughs> like, it could be, but I not. did Google search hard <coughs> and find one with a Toyota symbol in it, so it like our tire. <laughs> Okay, well, let me tell you my story about this, and you guys probably, anyone who lives on a gravel road, and I only live on, it's, it's only a mile and a half out and back, so it's three miles for each trip. My, my 80,000 mile tires that I got last year are now needing to be replaced. Yeah. You only drive five miles an hour, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I don't think speed, I mean, because I would think, you know, the faster you go, the less contact there is. <laughs> I just float over the top. That's my granddad's theory. He went through a lot of tires. All right. 
So then that's also, um, we've got the shale in between each of those, um, which is a sedimentary rock that's formed from fine muds that are converted into rock by compaction. Um, so shale actually forms in a more terrestrial environment, so not in an aquatic environment. So, so now we're saying that our cyclothem, our altered remaining layers, means that this environment was aquatic then not, aquatic and then not, aquatic and not, so that's kind of interesting. So um, this repetitive cycle of marine and terrestrial conditions is actually caused by glacier advance and retreat from the South Pole during the Paleozoic era. So these pictures here um, to kind of show what we were talking about earlier with Pangaea was that one large landmass and then um, it broke up and moved to its current day positions over time. So we've got the different time, some uh, different time periods. This is the longest ago that I have in the picture. Um, so this would be the middle of the Ordovician then the late Ordovician, the Silurian, the early Devonian, the late Devonian. So we're getting closer and closer to present day, or at least present day of our rocks, which is still a long time ago, like 300 million years ago. So the late Devonian, the early Carboniferous, the late Carboniferous, and then here's the early Permian. So um, during the early Permian, there was this ice age that's happening here in the south. So as those glaciers um, would melt, then all of that water would be put back into the oceans and sea level is rising. That actually created an inland sea um, where we're located and caused our um, marine environment. And then as it um, froze, um, then that would bring some of that water back out of the oceans, lower sea level, and then create the terrestrial environment that formed our shale. So that happened time and time again. So there was this advance and retreat of the glaciers in the South Pole that made <coughs> our cyclothem occur. If, if, is, it, is it true that like 95% of the glaciers are in the South Pole? I, I read that someplace. Great, great factoid. Didn't know it. <laughs> I didn't know it, but that could be. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. I read it in a paper. If, if you're ever in Indianapolis, go to their historic muse history museum. They have a 12-foot globe that runs from Pangaea all the way through as, as a an animation. And wow. it's you know, it round globe. It is absolutely <coughs> fascinating to watch that. Very cool. Field trip. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So because we're in sedimentary rock layers, we also have fossils that tell us about our past here. So um, I'm going to switch over to a YouTube video. It'll quickly just remind you how fossils are formed. I know that you guys already know, but that's okay. I thought since it's Saturday morning, we'd start it with a cartoon, you know. <laughs> so my apologies to anybody who doesn't like cartoons. This actually covers all four, like uh, several different types of how fossils form.
And it, you're using a lot of plant terms, but they, they were animals. Right. In fact, yes. you know, there, there weren't a whole lot of, you know, no, certainly not, definitely not a whole lot of vascular plants, and especially in the ocean, so yeah, so we're finding an animal. To point out, crinoids are not plants. Also, we'll find fusilinids, um, which are single-celled marine organisms that are about the size and shape of a grain of wheat. And actually, the Dewey Ranch House is made of the cottonwood limestone that was quarried here on site. Um, if you just peek out the door that you came in, you're going to see fusilinids right on the in the limestone that um, the ranch is made out of. So that's pretty cool. Um, as a fun fact, um, fusilinids are really important to scientists because they evolved really quickly and they changed um, <laughs> from the size of like a pinhead to like. They're, they're always single cell, but they are inside um, their inner chambers have changed so much so drastically. Um, so scientists can look at fusilinids in rock layers um, from like Kansas all the way over to Russia and find that they were formed during the same time period because of fusilinids. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Do you find uh, higher level organisms also follow up into the more recent layers? Are they more prominent or did some of them in the lower levels also be found in the higher ones? Or did they disappear and evolve into something else? I think they evolved over time. The, the we see the crinoid up high, and the fusilins are down low, and then, you know, stromalites, do you have those in your... I don't have those in my And those are algae lower, but those, there's some really nice ones down in the how layer mm -hmm. of those. So it's a progression in fossils also then. Yeah. yeah right. Okay. So we've got um, and we're going to have it, I'm going to toss it over to Joe here really soon um, to go over like all of the different fossils that, and rock specimens that he's brought in because they were awesome. Um, but really quickly, I just want to say, um, you might be thinking, well, where are all the rocks above the Permian? Like, hello. There's not a lot of time period that we're missing in our um, rocks, and actually that's all due to a major erosional event that followed the Permian. So um, that's all been eroded away through most of Kansas, actually. Um, you, you won't find many rocks from the Mesozoic um, era at all here in Kansas. Um, but there is loose sediment deposited from the Pleistocene, which is clear up here, right on top of our Permian-aged um, rocks. So we do see some, and actually during that Pleistocene was another ice age, um, and the glaciers actually advanced all the way as close as Juan Migo. Um, so um, there is deposit from glacial meltwaters um, during the Pleistocene ice age that are on top of our much older rocks from the Permian period. So, Keith Miller said last year that actually was enough Pennsylvania and Permian, mm -hmm. you can't actually tell where in that hundred million years you are, that the, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, the late Pennsylvania into Permian. The, the, there's 50 million years in there, but you don't know which one of those 50 million years you're in. Yeah. Why, why is that? Because you can see all the layers, you can see all the different fossils. Right. That's a very good question. I don't know if maybe because of, you know, all those alterations happening so quickly. I'm not sure why that is, like why we can't pinpoint it if, um, like scientists to form the um, you know ages that are along here on this side, um, some of that's formed through um, like radioactive isotopes using radioactive isotopes. So um, I'm not sure you know if it's just not specific enough to that. But that's a good question. Why is there? Why are there these <coughs> gaps? Let's see. Alrighty. So. Um, I want to end on Rock's Rock because um, they saved our tall grass prey from the plow. So in addition to telling, Rock's are awesome because they tell the story of our past environment and we wouldn't have known all of that if it weren't for the fact that we have these rock layers that we can study. Um, but also, this is a picture um, that Eva, she did our um, presentation during um, the orientation. Um, she took this picture right after one of the spring burns, and you can see all of the rocks here in the hillside. Well, as people, um, you know, were looking for a land to plow, this isn't really some area that would be really good to plow, so it, it did help to preserve our tall grass very here. Um, so, it's a rock's rock for a variety of reasons. Um, but, like I said, I do want to hand it over to Joe, if that's okay with him, to show you all of 
his awesome specimen. I think that'll be pretty interesting. And also, this is way out in the future, but make sure when you look on your way out of the, the, on the side of the door, you can see all those fuselinates. And are there some right there? I haven't even looked on our mantle. Um, you might be able to see some fuselinates. They just look like little grains. Um, and Joe has a bunch to show you as well. Let's. Oh, so. <laughs> I think you're all exaggerating, but I'm a, everything I know is self-taught. I'm not a professional. Yes, you are. I went to KU. I graduated in 62. Most of my paleontology knowledge was from an old textbook, and I I just apply what I know. And That's if you want us, I'm the kind of awesome. First of all, really thank you. Appreciate it for a good presentation. You can find these fossils through the Kansas, the Republican, the Nemaha, the Delaware, the rivers that form the Kansas River, and the creeks that form those rivers. And you can also find them in the Big River. Most, I didn't collect any of these Oconsa, but you, you will find... No collecting on Oconsa. Yeah, that's right. You will find the brachiopods, and the crinoids on cans on on Kansas. You can see them if you look very carefully when you're hiking. Go up some of the rock formations. Most of these fossils are all from the late Pennsylvania into the Permian. And of course, anybody that knows about geology knows right after the Permian, you have the tertiary, you have the case. case the extinction time period. Ninety percent of all life on Earth. It's gone because of climate change, etc. First of all, we're going to just you can come up here and go by here. I'm going to start with bivalves, clams. Do you want to just pass them around or do you want? Yes. It's kind of crowded up there. You, this one right here, I even looked up the, the species. Everybody knows a clam, equal, equal shells. Pod, they crawl along the bottom of the ocean. Now, a brachiopod. One shell is the way Dr. Keith Miller explained it, I never could quite get it. But one shell is superior to the other one. You see it like this. See the one shell is a little bit superior or larger. Whereas a clam crawls along the floor and he can move upon a brachiopod, the vessel, he's permanent. And he comes out the top of the shell. Remember, these are animals, invertebrates. Everybody knows what's invertebrate, no backbone. But when you, when you first look at them, and you're not, if you find, if you can find one complete, I'm going to pass this around. This is a complete brachiopod, but you'll see the superior shell here. Remember, the little creature comes out right here. At the beak, where the clam comes out at the bottom. Just pass that around and look at that. And well, we'll start here. Here's another good example. We'll pass this around. These are mostly oysters. These are bivalves, equal shells again. And you every now and then you'll find something that's of museum quality. Everybody knows what mud cracks are. Yeah. You, if you walk along the river bank and it dries out after a flood, it's real slick, but it dries out, it cracks and curls up. And there's these little cracks or holes. And usually they're filled in quickly when the sand blows across them or rain washes more mud in there. But ever so often, they're kept open for a long enough period of time that another mineral, this is probably calcite or maybe gypsum, that forms in there. Look how striking that is. And if you, when you're hiking, if you look and pay attention, you'll see these very unusual, that's a museum quality specimen. It normally, <laughs> normally, normally you're going to find them like this. Now these are relatively common. There's the mud cracks. 
We'll pass it around. You can see how something filled in. In one place up on the Nemahaw, you'll find these cephalopods, which are what they call belemites. They're like a nautilus. Everybody knows what a nautilus is. It's a tube. It has tentacles on the front, and it motivates like a, you know, crawdad. Backward, shoots out. And they're always formed. I don't know why I have this fossil. It's translucent. I do not know what the material is. It's the only place I find it. <coughs> Now, the corals we have from that time period are mostly solitary. They're not reef building, like you all know. Of course, corals form in uh, you know relatively shallow water. These are what they call horn corals. We'll pass that around. And then this is the only one I found. This is. A mollusk, but it's called gastropoda. You can usually tell them by spiral shaped shells, and here's a very good example. And anybody that wants the crinoids, you're welcome to take two or three because I have probably seven or eight times as many. And the reason you only find this is because they're washed, you know, the streams break up the rocks, whereas the whole crinoid stem. In the Medusa head, you know, get lost. I haven't found only uh, honey fossils, only two calyx or the heads twice. Wow. So you're welcome to these. You see where little branches come off? That's where the little arms came off of them. And you'll see the little plates, individual plates. The Indians often took those, drilled through, and made beads. And you'll if you look close on Kanza, you'll see the little <coughs> round crinoid staring at you. And then you'll see the longitudinal part of the stem if you look really, really close. Can you close. pass that piece around, George? Yes, okay, we'll do <laughs> Now, when Mr. Miller was here, he, he gave an outstanding talk about uh, the geology of Kanza. And when you're hiking Butterfly Hill, remember, that the Permian Ocean and the Lake Pennsylvania were never much deeper than 600 feet. That was probably the deepest. You know, when the glaciers sucked up the water, it got dry. Really, really dry like the Persian Gulf. And you have what's formed are these evaporites in the arid uh, environment at that time. When you hike Butterfly Hill, you will find real small portions of these evaporites from the very, very dry time period of those. We'll pass that around. We see those on the, the south side of Butterfly Hill? What? On the south side of Butterfly Hill? see that. Going up the side that's kind of facing us here, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And then the one that everybody likes to talk about <laughs> is the fusil the fusilinids. You know, I think at one time there were there were some that are developed so much that they had nine individual layers of the fusilinids. Like Kaylee said, they can study how the development of fusilinids and you know through through the time period. And pass the fusilinid around. Okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody if you go to the benches outside the Manhattan Library, there's just stacks of them. So you can tell the kids, because they go, if they're from Manhattan, when they go home, because most of them go to the library, so then they can go look. It's really cool. It's just thick. In the, the Permian. Yes, ma'am. Is this the primary? No, that's a horn coral. Horn coral. Coral. The Indians, particularly the Three Mile Formation, looked for flint nodules. And if you break them open, See the layers? The dark colored layers are often translucent. They get greenish yellow, and it is the, the best. Now, <coughs> any of that gray in there can be worked, but the most fine grain layers around the outside are the easiest to work. And the older Paleo Indians preferred the best material. 
And this is a flint nodule. And like they said before, they don't know exactly how it forms, except you have this layer of limestone. And within it, these pockets develop through groundwater, chemical reaction. The limestone is taken away in this silica is built up in here, but notice how it's layered. Somebody needs to do some kind of research and exactly how this happens. I don't know. All I know is you find it everywhere. The Indians crack these That's open correct. to check. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here's even a bigger piece of a nodule. And my favorite here are the erratics. If you go, if you ever hike, excuse me, canoe the Kansas River, get in and float right before you get to St. George, the river turns north. And within the riverbed are these huge maroon or red rocks that shows you how far the glaciers skate down. And you can see, like Haley said, cuts a conglomerate quartzite, Sioux quartzite, comes from South Dakota, brought down here by the glaciers. And they're all different colors. And I'll pass one around that's got really nice bands in it so you can see. But if you're ever out hiking and walking a river or you drive through, a, a, see a guy's work the field, and you'll see lots of times they'll you know, take the red rocks and throw them to the side. You know that's where the, gla the glaciers came that far and brought this Sioux quartzite down. It was in my yard. I've got Sioux quartzite all over. I have to put the lawnmower light up to go over the Sioux quartzite. <laughs> <laughs> and then put it back down on the other side of the rock. Finish this off with ancient Native American used this Sioux quartzite. The metamorphic rock. And I told this story earlier. I was hiking a creek with this guy. And I let him go before I had did. And this rock's turned upside down like this. And he walks right on by. Well, I've hunted arrowheads all my life. So I picked it up and turned it over. See that? That's a, a matate. You know, an Aztec word. And the reason these came into existence about uh, so 7,500 years ago, for about 4,000 years, because the climate dried out. And the Indians, before that time, the grasses were coming on. They ignored all the grasses and wheat seeds. But they, in order to survive, to process those wheat seeds, they needed something where they could grind them up. And that's how the mono and the matani came in existence. This didn't come from it. It's, it's, Quartzite again, glacier rock, but it's just that's what the original one would have looked like. And you can always tell them if they have a slight depression, but if they're smoothed from the rubbing. How do you spell that? Metate? M E T A T E. Okay. Metate, and this is called mano, M A N O, handstone. So matate is basically a, a flat curved surface for grinding corn, or grinding grain. Corn, like, the corn grinders ones are real, you know, they have troughs and all right. that. Yeah. But remember, they grab, yes sir. You didn't miraculously find those together, did you? No, no. Okay, that would, you do uh, once in a while, but when you do, they'll be found upside down with it underneath, but usually they don't, they're not together. The real heavy ones, we're always left on a site. This happened oh, about 25 years ago. My oldest son, he's a pharmacist, Casper. I let him out west of Amarillo. And he walked seven miles off of the cap rock. And I picked him up again later in the day. He had on third block four points. He said, Dad, I found the most beautiful matante you've ever seen. I said, where is it? It's too heavy to carry out. So he found it in a, you know, under an overhang, and he uh, stashed it. You know, about two years later, a guy that we knew that knew the rancher and everything could get us within oh half a mile of it. And his younger brother carried it out, weighed 93 pounds. Wow. 
And it has a bowl on one side and a bowl on the other side. Just remember, if when you're doing this, get permission of the landowner. But there's lots of places on the Kansas River and even the Blue and Smoky Hill where, you know, it's state land and stuff. You're not supposed to pick up fossils when you do that on state and government land. So get permission from the landowner. But this, these are out there if you just pay attention. 